Hello, hello, and welcome to my thought on Sunday. And this time I got it on Sunday. Uh, last time I, it was Saturday and I thought it was Sunday. But this time it is Sunday and it is snowing in London. And I'm uh, going to give you some thoughts on uh, snowing uh, and what it's like in the, the American Midwest because the people here in London uh, have no idea what a real snowstorm is like. Uh, but before I start, I want to remind you um, that at 5.45 London time, uh, every Sunday, uh, I will be chatting with Kate Capstick. Uh, t uh, today she's in Kenya, so we hope that it'll work. Um, but she's not very techy, and neither am I, so we're liable to just mess it up. But it will be on my Instagram, uh, my Instagram uh, link, which is Lynn Ruth Miller. And if you want to uh, laugh and uh, think a little, uh, there's nothing like Kate Copstick and her caustic remarks. Uh, I'm just um, a catalyst in this program, but I love doing it. It's called Old Bitches Talking Shit, and that's pretty much what we do. But today I'm going to uh, not talk shit. I'm going to tell you stories about the snow. And when I think of, when I was a child, I absolutely loved the snow uh, because I didn't have to drive in it. We would make snowmen, and we would make them with little carrots for noses and decorate them with little hats. And Oh, I just loved it. And we would make angels in the snow. And if you've never met angels in the snow, you really must. And there's enough snow out there now so you can do it. You lie down on your back, and you bend your hands up and down like that. And you have an angel. And I used to love tobogganing because you would go. We had, um, we had lots of hills in uh, Toledo, especially in Ottawa Park. And we would go there and toboggan, and I would get to hug the person in front of me, and the person behind me would hug me. And when I was a child, I was not hugged very much. Uh, my sister was, but I was not. I think probably because I was too bony, but whatever it was, uh, I got to hug people, and I just loved that. So I loved the snow, but as I got older, uh, I realized that the snow obstructs traffic, and it also can be very dangerous and can be very treacherous. And at that time, uh, as, as I got older, I lived in, um, I went through several <laughs> winters, uh, but by this time I was in my uh, late 30s and 40s, late 30s and 40s, and I lived in Oregon, Ohio, just outside of Perrysburg, and we had absolutely horrible snowstorms. You, you people don't understand what it's like when the snow drifts are taller than I am, much taller, they were six feet, and I am only four foot ten. So, and I lived in this mobile home, which, which uh, is not that um, secure. And I can still remember the Christmas when I woke up and um, I looked outside, and of course uh, the water had frozen and there was no electricity, so in order to brush my teeth I had to use a flame, a, a, a torch, not the torch that you people call, which is a light, but this is a flame uh, to defrost the water that was frozen in the pipe so I could break, brush my teeth. And, and uh, I was trying to uh, figure out a way uh, to rub two stones together to get some fire to make breakfast. And my mother called, and my mother was in her very posh uh, suburban home uh, where they took care of the streets and uh, kept it uh, ice-free and snow-free, and I was out in the country where you couldn't even see the road. And my mother said to me, it was Christmas, and my mother said to me, so, what did Santa Claus bring you for Christmas? And I said, well, I don't know what he brought me, but I know what he took away, which is the carport. And my mother said, ah, 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 ah. She said, I understand that the helicopters, which were bringing us food because we were snowed in and could not get out, have decorated the packages. And she, I said, you're in for a treat. And I said, no, I'll, t I'll, be, I'll settle for a thaw. But let me tell you a little bit more about that snow. Uh, as all of you know, and you know me, uh, I walk every day. I walk every day. And uh, I had a little dog named David, a little teeny black dog. And if you um, get this book, Getting the Last Lap, you can see a picture of David. He's a little black dog with a little pink tongue, and he was, uh, he saved my life. Uh, he's what made me well after those years in the hospital. And he and I would go walking. And this is what would happen. In order to go out in this cold, cold. When you have snow uh, here, it's actually warm. It's, 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 it feels good. But when you have snow in Toledo, Ohio, and Oregon, Ohio, which is right outside of Toledo, uh, it, it's painful uh, to breathe. You cover your nose and you cover, because it's actually painful. Any 
liquid <laughs> coming from your face or your nose or your eyes freezes immediately because the because the temperature is so far below uh, freezing. Um, so I would get ready to go, and I would put a couple sweaters on David, who already had a very thick coat, uh, and then uh, and he would wait. Bless his heart, he would just wait. And I would put on several sweaters and several pairs of slacks. Then I would put on my snowmobile suit. Then I would wrap a scarf around my neck and a scarf around my face, and I would start putting on hats. And then, of course, by that time, I had to go to the bathroom. So I would take everything off and go, go to the bathroom and then come back and do the whole thing again. Then I would put on several gloves and I would leash up David and we would go outside. And in order to get out of my mobile home, I had to hang on because there was a sheet of ice covered with snow. And as we walked, uh, and of course you couldn't see my car. My car was in Renault and I'll tell you more about that. You couldn't see it. It was covered with snow. And David and I would go out and this dog never complained, not the dogs can complain, but he loved the snow. And he would go into the snow drift and then pop out and he looked like a little black jumping jack when he would uh, drive. But I also worked. And another thing that I have never done uh, is miss an obligation. I never let, let uh, the weather or my state of health uh, interfere with my going to something I have said that I'm going to go to. So I had to work and I would have to be uh, at my, I worked at the University of Toledo. That's 25, 30 miles uh, from Oregon where I lived. And I would have to get there at eight o'clock in the morning. In order to leave at eight o'clock in the morning, to get there at eight o'clock in the morning, um, I would have to, um, I would have to get up at five. However, this time, what I'm telling you about is not, uh, is, was earlier because I was working at a grade school and I, I was working in the seventh grade, uh, the uh, uh, seven-year-olds. And I, I drove, and this was to Elmhurst School, and I would drive there. And uh, the snows were so bad that it, I would have to leave at five in the morning to get there at eight. And I would go in and I would, when I first got there, the parking lot was cleared enough so I could take this little Renault and park it by my window. And as I taught, because they're there from eight until three, actually until four, um, as I taught, I would gaze out the window and I would see snow and I would think, oh my God, I'll never get out. And then at the end of the day, I would go to the custodian whose name was Tiny. And he was about, I mean, to me, he was seven feet tall, but he wasn't, he was just a very big man. And I would say to him, I've got to back the car out of the parking lot. And he would say, that's all right. Uh, at that time, it was Mrs. Trigger. That's all right, Mrs. Trigger. I'll take care of this. And he went outside, and he would lift the Renault and shake the snow off. And I couldn't believe it. It was just, it, it was humiliating. It was, uh, and put it on the on the street, um, because uh, as you would drive, and I would drive home, and it would take me three four hours to drive home because trees would be falling into the highway, and and. Uh, Cars would be skidding into each other, and ambulances would be weaving in and out trying to pick up the people that had, had fallen in the snow, and little children would be standing on the corners uh, weeping for their mommies and daddies. Uh, and I would finally get home. It would be something like 8 or 9 at night. The pipes were frozen. There was no water. Uh, so I decided after one winter where uh, there was a terrible storm in Buffalo and then an awful one in uh, Toledo. Now, by this time, I was 48 years old. I had put up with uh, 48 disgusting winters, uh, except for the two when I was in California. Uh, and each one got worse. Each one got worse. And, I, and at the time, I applied for a job. I'd been applying for a job since I was 31 and had graduated from Stanford. But I finally got a job in Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma City had no snow. They never had snow. They're, they're moderate. They're not uh, tropical, but they had no snow. They had cold winters, but never freezing. So I thought the hell with it. I'm done. I'm done with these winters. I'm absolutely done. And if you think it's bad to live in a place where there, um, where the snow is is uh, overwhelming, try living in a place where they've never had snow before, because they have absolutely no equipment uh, to c combat the snow. And uh, there was ice and snow on the on the ground in Oklahoma City in June. And, uh, and not only that, but the place smelled of cow shit because the stockyards are in the middle of the city. And I wondered whether I had improved my lot by leaving Toledo, which was submerged in ice from October 31st until May 31st. And then uh, the temperature would immediately then rise to uh, 100. And you would cook from uh, 
June 1st until October 30th. Uh, and I thought nothing could be worse than this. And yes, it was. In Oklahoma City, it was worse. When there was ice on the streets, you couldn't drive in, in June. Um, but um, the, 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 um, the, the one story I do want to tell you uh, is a story about what it feels like when the winter is finally over, when the winter is finally over. Uh, as you know, I was in the hospital uh, for my 36th year um, in and out uh, for uh, four months, and then, and then I came home, and then another month, and then I was in the hospital, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, which was a disaster. Um, they gave me medication that stopped my breathing, and if it hadn't been for uh, a nurse uh, walking through the corridor, I would be dead because I could not breathe. Um, and when I came home, uh, I spent th the winter mostly inside because I was emaciated and I was uh, still sick. Uh, I did have David, but I was still sick. Uh, and before I had left for the hospital in January, um, I'm trying to think how long this was. In the middle of all this, I had uh, found a packet of um, marigolds. And I had two cats, Michael and Eileen, and they liked to eat, they liked to eat plants. So I had planted um, uh, African violets in gutters up high so the cats couldn't get them. And I mean, the handyman in the trailer park helped me get them up there. And in the dirt that the, 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 that the African violets were in, I planted a mar a marigold seeds. And then, of course, uh, I, I would go into the hospital and come back and go into the hospital and come back. And my neighbors, bless their heart, they were wonderful there, um, watered my African violets and, of course, the marigold seeds, which they didn't know were there. And I remember the first year that I had gotten out of the hospital that I finally said, I'm not going back into the hospital ever again because the doctors can't solve it and, and they're just making me sicker. And uh, it was the end of winter, it was April. And I walked into my, my studio, my art studio, which had the African violets in it, and I saw a marigold, one marigold had made it and it bloomed. And I thought, oh my God, it's a miracle. And I looked at that miracle, and I thought of my time in the hospital and the numbers of people that were there that had died because I was in a, term, in a hospital where people were terminally ill, and they had all died, and I hadn't. And I looked at that, mir that miracle, and I thought, oh my God, what a miracle. But the real miracle was that I was there to see it. And I want to thank you for joining me for my, uh, my winter thoughts, my winter thoughts. Remind you that I have a, um, a book, <laughs> and it now has, I think, something like 15 five-star reviews, so oh my God, it's called Getting the Last Laugh. Uh, it's a perfect thing to, um, if you want to learn how to do comedy, there is a section in there where I talk about a set and how I make it work. And if you want to learn about perseverance, read the whole thing. Getting the Last Laugh, it's on Amazon. At 5.45, I'll be chatting with Kate Kopstick. And hopefully, I'll make it next Monday and do, uh, well, next Monday, I'm doing a Facebook Live um, show, uh, which I've messed up the last three months. So I'm not guaranteeing you'll be able to see it, but that will be on Facebook, and that will be at 8 o'clock um, British time. Very busy Sunday next Sunday. But this Sunday, I'm just asking you to listen to Kate Kopstick and, and order my book if you feel like it. And think about how lucky you are if you don't live in Toledo, Ohio in the winter. And thank you so much for joining me for my thoughts.